So welcome to Professionally Speaking, Sharad and Professional Dwy Vil Adenau, held by the Education Workforce Council and the Open University Wales. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the wonderful setting of the National Museum. What better place is there to discuss the vision for the education system than at the heart of a building which is full of our national history, our cultural history and our natural history? will be a bilingual event, as I'm sure you've clocked by now, and I see a lot of you turning to your translation equipment. I'm told that they're quite easy to operate if you just hold them to your ears, and then there's a, a wheel underneath, so if you turn it to on, it should work, and our trusty translator up there will be uh, translating um, all the contributions in Welsh this evening, and I'll give you a chance to test it out now. Um, so let me introduce the order and content of the evening for you. A number of you already know, having been here over recent years, you know that we've had a variety of fantastic speakers and very interesting and engaging speakers from Professor Donaldson to Professor Furlong, and last year, a whole stage of commissioners. But this year we have three from very varied backgrounds on the stage. But there's more than this, than their surnames in common between them this evening. The three will be speaking on the subject of natural education and the role of the environment in our education. Three speakers tonight will be giving us their take on a natural environment. The role our environment does and indeed should play in our education system. None of them, I'm sure, will require much introduction, but uh, speaking first tonight will be our Education Secretary, Kirsty Williams. Esgrifennydd Addis Cymru, Kirsty Williams, fydd yn agor yn oson heno. In post, since 2016, she's currently presiding over the introduction of an educational reform you'll all be with, familiar with, I'm sure, following on from the Donaldson Review. But splitting her time between her office in Cardiff Bay and her constituency and home in Brecon and Radna, we look forward to hearing her take on the case for a natural education. Ryle Shradraig Heno, the second Williams to take to the stage tonight, will be Sue Williams, who's on the far right there, or your far left, of course, in the audience. Sue Williams of Natural Resources Wales, um, in, involves itself with Outdoor Learning Wales, which is facilitated by Natural Resources Wales. It's a national network aimed at increasing the understanding, appreciation and sustainable management of natural re resources in relation to Wales. So we look forward to hearing more about your work this evening too. A trydydd Williams i gami y llwyfan heno, the third Williams taking to the stage this evening, will be the naturalist, campaigner, all-weather shorts wearer, TV presenter, Birdman Yolo Williams. Familiar to most of you, I'm sure, for his various TV series on nature in, in and around Wales, in Welsh and in English, on the BBC and SOC, and most recently, presenting Yolo's Snowdonia on BBC One Wales. So we're looking f we look forward to hearing your valuable contribution on this issue as well. Croesoi Chichtri, welcome to the three of you. After we hear from all our speakers this evening, there will be chance to take questions from you in the audience. Vid Kavle, Ichiovin questionnaire. So get your questions ready. We really do want to get as much audience engagement as is possible this evening. On Tabith Wade Tragor, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Welsh Cabinet Secretary for Education, Kirsty Williams, to open the evening. Croeso, Kirsty. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much to the EWC for the invitation to join you all here uh, this evening. Three quarters of UK children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates. I'm sure you'd agree with me, it is a really shocking statistic. Shocking and saddening, actually. Wales is such a beautiful country, yet on an av on, on average day, around one-fifth of our children spend no time playing outside at all. Now, my children are lucky. Growing up on a farm, they don't have much choice about interacting with nature. And it's also a great leveller for me, too. If I go home and start to complain about a stressful day in the bay, my husband will say, really? I've had a cow with a C-section and somebody's left the gate open and the sheep have gone. Don't talk to me about a terrible, stressful day. And it does help me keep things in perspective. And we all know 
the benefits to children and indeed adults of being outdoors and getting close to nature. It improves our physical health and development. It increases mental health and well-being. It reminds our children, indeed perhaps it could remind all of us, that there is a world beyond Minecraft, Fortnite, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And of course, above all, more than anything else, being outside is fun. Now, our young people are growing up in a world very different to the one that I grew up in. Global connections are unlike anything we have ever seen before. A mobile phone today contains more computing power than the whole of NASA in 1969, and every day it seems like there is a new game to worry about or a new threat to safety and privacy from social media. But sending our children, or simply saying to send our children out to play, is not a simple antidote. We also know that many parents and carers worry about that too. Gone are the days of my childhood when my mother packed us off with sandwiches and a drink and didn't expect us back until tea time. As I've said, my children are lucky. They know where their food comes from. In fact, they've been on first name terms with some of it. They know what it means if there's not enough rain or if there's too much or it the wrong time of year. But let's be clear, that is down purely to the fact of where they live and what their father does for a living. Not all of our children have the same advantages and I believe it is up to us therefore to help and to try and redress that balance. And that's why we have a national mission for education. This mission, to raise standards for everyone, to reduce the attainment gap, and ensure a system that enjoys public confidence and is a source of national pride is ambitious and rightly so. I want to build an education system that works for everyone and one that isn't just focused on grades and exams, important as they are, and believe me, they are important. If our children are happy, confident individuals, we know that they will simply be better at facing life's challenges. They will be more engaged in school and they will have, on average, higher levels of academic achievement. I firmly believe that spending time learning about and experiencing nature and the outdoors will make our children happier. Now in Wales, we're fortunate to have the foundation phase for our youngest learners. For many children, this is having a positive impact on attendance, literacy, numeracy, and overall attainment. Now, the use of outdoor facilities is essential to the delivery of our foundation phase. It gives children the chance to enjoy the natural world through a stimulating learning environment. A learning environment that supports their physical and mental well-being, as well as helping to develop their social skills. Evidence tells us that in addition to having fun, being outdoors and active stimulates better learning for children. They actually learn better, though they might not, of course, come home quite as clean as some mums would like. By explicitly including well-being in our national mission, we have put out a very clear message that the well-being of learners is important and schools need to focus on this. And within our new curriculum, we're develop developing the health and well-being area of learning and experience. Within this, we acknowledge those things that we know to be true. Our environment and the circumstances we find ourselves in affect our health and well-being. Our identity is informed by how we engage with the space, time and place around us. How many times have we heard someone say, they're a valley boy or a country girl. Now, I'm not here to condemn technology, far from it. But there is something rather perverse about a world where children and adults play games about building towns, running farms and designing gardens without actually setting foot outdoors. If we do not address this, we risk raising an entire generation 
which doesn't understand nature at all. So you are a room of educators, but nature herself is a great teacher, and she provides most of her resources for free. We just need to provide the wellies and the waterproof and the will. And sometimes, if we're extremely lucky, maybe sunblocks and hats. And this is where our schools come in. They need to equip young people for life. Young people need to leave formal education being able to learn new skills, apply knowledge creatively and positively be able to adapt to the world around them. Let me assure you, I'm not sitting in an ivory tower in Cardiff Bay doing this with a few select civil servants. This curriculum is being developed by teachers and practitioners through our network of pioneer schools. Schools that represent the wide diversity that we have in Wales, rural and urban, bilingual, English medium, Welsh medium, primary, secondary, special schools, small schools, and large schools, and faith schools. I don't think I've missed anybody out. And we're not about to put nature in a box here. We know the overlaps and the interdependencies with humanities, and this links to environmental studies, citizenship, social and ethical influences, human geography, spirituality, science. We have an opportunity, a fantastic opportunity, to shape the lives of a generation and to produce the kind of citizens Wales needs now and in the future. And I'm going to do everything that I can to ensure that that opportunity is not wasted. I'm very keen to hear from my fellow contributors this evening and answer your questions, but thank you for your interest tonight. Diolch Fawr. Thank you very much, Kirsty Williams, for opening this evening. Diolch yn fawr iawn i chi fyna, and I am sure many of us are looking forward to discussing further some of that vision that you set out there. But now I will introduce our second speaker, Sue Williams of Natural Resources Wales. Croeso i chi, Sue Williams. Not without power, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, uh, and thank you for the introduction. In my job title, if you need to know, is Senior Advisor for Children Education, Lifelong Learning and Skills for Natural Resources Wales. Quite a mouthful. And a bit of background, Natural Resources Wales is the largest public funded body in Wales with a purpose to sustainably manage our natural resources in all of its work. That's quite a mouthful as well. But basically it means we need to look after our air, land, water, wildlife, plants and soil to improve Wales' well-being and to contribute to a better future for everyone. Very encouraging to hear the Cabinet Secretary's positive support for outdoor learning. I think I'm probably going to reiterate some of the points you've made. But by outdoor learning, we mean everything from residential stays, adventure education, recognised methods like forest school and coastal school, that I'm sure some of you are, are well into delivering, field studies, environmental education, use of our school grounds, our beaches, woods and local parks. You can also hear the term outer classroom learning, and that encompasses visits to the museum, the local shops, churches and museums and things like that. Anywhere really that can provide those rich learning experiences. And as the Qualified for Life document states, a chance to develop a breadth of activities that expand horizons within and beyond the traditional learning environment of the classroom. And it's beyond the environment of the classroom that we're interested in tonight. And tonight we're obviously going to be concentrating on the natural environment and its multiple benefits. It's also a pleasure to be sharing the stage with um, Yolo tonight. We have met before, but I wasn't sure whether he'd recognise me. As last time we met, I was dressed a little differently. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's me in the costume, although I've got that boring, stuffy job title, I do get to do fun things like that. Dressing up as a squirrel, dressing up as an owl. Yeah, the morning, I'd already been to the Menai Straits for the scenic shot and to the local pool. And why, may you ask? Well, I was too slow to pick up the camera, so I had to put the costume on. But actually, it was all linked with our Acorn Antics campaign. So this is live at the moment, our 2018 campaign, and it encourages education settings to get out and about, survey their local area, and find one or two or three oak trees. That's the first challenge, because not all our young people these days can even identify an oak tree. We had a recent teacher training um, exercise up in North Wales, and we said to the teachers there, so how many trees do you think your classes might be able to identify? One of them said, oh, I'd be lucky if they knew it was a tree. 
thought, oh, okay, a bit more work to do there then. But anyway, once they have located their oak trees, they then need to decide whether they're a sessile oak or a pedunculate oak. So in case you need this information for your pub quiz, sessile oaks have stalks on their leaves and pedunculate oaks have stalks on their acorns. You never know when that might come in handy. But once they've done that, they need to seek the landowner's permission to collect the acorns, they need to suss out the grid reference, they need to organise their collecting teams and get out in the fresh air and do lots of walking, bending and collecting of acorns into the right coloured sacks. It takes quite a while to fill a sack. Acorns are this big, the sacks are this big. So plenty of time to breathe in all that lovely fresh air. And once the sacks are full, they have to label them, they can weigh them and work out how much they might get paid for them. Because actually the underlying reason we're asking education settings to do this is so we can collect acorns from as many diverse locations across Wales so we can build a really genetically diverse seed bank. And they get paid per kilogram for collecting them. They drop them off at a local NRW office and then they get transported to the Forestry Commission tree nursery over in Delamere in Cheshire and they get planted out, grown on, and eventually come back and get replanted into Wales, uh, into the woodlands across Wales. So as well as the learning that goes on in preparing and actually taking part in that activity, the local knowledge, the tree ID, the map reading, the understanding grid references, the weights and measurements, the understanding of a sustainable crop, we also have a load of curriculum linked activities covering various ways to measure height, width and girth and age of a tree from the very technical tree-hugging way of estimating um, girth and the handspan technique, to the even more technical method of looking through your legs to estimate the height of a tree, to the actually making accurate measurements using kilometres and hypsometers. There's also activities and games to explain everything from seed dispersal and germination to how a tree works. And all of these can be taught outside in the real-world setting and then built on back in the classroom. So thinking of our new curriculum, what do successful futures look like? Probably different for each one of us, depending on our own experiences and values and beliefs. We all know that a successful future isn't just about academic achievement alone. It does, it's not a one-size-fits-all box, and it requires a holistic approach. And in terms of a holistic learning environment, the Wales' biggest and best classroom is its great outdoors. So as Kirsty was saying, evidence from across the world shows that outdoor learning promotes academic attainment through hands-on learning and it enhances the cognitive and uh, emotional processes that we need to learn. And this in turn can support the delivery of the four purposes as the natural environment is vibrant and flexible and it basically gives enough space for all the interests of all the different learners and, and, it, and, and can enhance their abilities as well. Same goes for the six areas of learning and experience. We're just beginning to see what those might mean for us in the future. But the experience part plays to the strengths of learning in nature. And hopefully you can see from that one simple activity of collecting acorns, how activities rooted in the natural environment, excuse the pun there, can work across the six areas, providing opportunities for increased physical activity, understanding biological processes, communication, literacy, science and technology. And if you saw the How a Tree Works activity, you could also appreciate the links to expressive arts. It's quite a lot of movement in that one. There's also all the opportunities for wider skill development, the problem solving, the critical thinking, the teamwork, assessing risk, uh, increasing environmental awareness and increasing self-confidence in new situations and links to the world of work and also having fun while you're doing it. So why is nature so relevant to learning? Despite the multiple and wide-ranging benefits of a connection to nature being so well documented, there's the growing global concern that populations are becoming increasingly disconnected from the natural world. So just a few generations ago, connecting to nature happened naturally in childhood. Being outside in natural spaces with our friends for long periods of time, playing and interacting no longer is the norm, and it's impacted on a variety of ways, including the reduction in childhood roaming, which is well documented now, we're told there's a dramatic rise in children's screen time, uh, so less time to be physically active, so children are living in a 2D world and not a 3D one. Vitamin D deficiency due to lack of sunlight is actually leading to a rise in rickets. Who thought we'd ever hear that? And we're being warned that increased short-sightedness in children is probably due to a lack of daylight. There's also young children with a lack of balance and coordination because they never walk on uneven ground. They're always on tarmac, on nice, nice straight pavements. And a real concern for NRW is the reduction in environmental knowledge and understanding. And in his book, Last Child in the Woods, Richard Liu states, for a new generation, nature is more abstract than reality. Increasingly, there's something to watch, to consume, to wear, to ignore. 
So you may have heard of terms like nature deficit disorder, which Louvre co coined, and also environmental generational amnesia, that's a mouthful, where modern children's baselines for healthy environments are degraded generation by generation, and it leads to adults with little understanding of the nature and its resources. So an extreme example is this, if you've never drunk pristine water, then dirty wa water is the norm. So, a bit of audience interaction then. Anyone like to hazard a guess at the percentage of children who don't know the difference between a wasp and a bee? I expect some of you have seen these infographics before. Any ideas? Are you, are you, are you phoning a friend? Well, 50%, it's been revealed, there we go. 50% can't tell the difference between a bee and a wasp, and it probably means they don't know the importance of those two species either. So what about children who can identify a dialect then? Higher or lower? Higher. How much higher? A lot. 90%. And probably with a new series of Doctor Who, that's going to go up to 100, isn't it? Okay, so childhood obesity. It was about 7% in the 1980s. How much in 2012? Higher or lower? Higher. Any guesses? 30, 15, 24. It's actually... 18%, over double, and we know that's rising, so that's probably much higher now. And hours a week on, screen, on the screens? 20, any advance on 20? I feel like an auctioneer. Okay, reveal please. 50 hours a week. It's not a lot of time for sleep, really, is there left with all of that? Okay, and lastly, children's roaming distance, six miles in 1915. I mean, I was a child of the, of the 70s, early 80s, and I remember doing six miles then as well. So how much now in 2015? 300 metres? Half a mile? Right, can we reveal, please? 300 yards. That's barely outside the front gate, is it, really? And actually, the most dramatic shrink in that roaming distance has been in the last 20 or 30 years. So it's all a bit shocking. Using the outdoors to learn in and about provides us with some opportunities to try and redress some of this, but we've come back a long way and we've got a long way to go to actually redress all of this. But if we make the connection in early childhood, it establishes a blueprint for later life. So recent research by the RSPB found that teenagers and young adults who disengage themselves from the natural world for whatever reason did come back to it at later life as long as they'd had that connection as a child. And I did see that in my, in my eldest daughter, who disappeared into her bedroom at about 12 with Harry Potter. And she'd been brought up on a small holding with her wellies welded to her feet, very like your children. There was no reason for her to suddenly go inside, but Harry Potter was a lure, and that was that. She only came out to tell us what an awful place it was we lived in, and the fact the bus didn't run quickly enough for her to go and see her friends. Now, as an adult, she lives in one of the remotest villages in North Wales. I doubt they've ever seen a bus. And her wellies are back on her feet, and she's back embracing a farming life. And I was really interested to see that. It's lovely when you see a bit of research and you can actually relate to it yourself. So, it's very important for all you foundation phase teachers and matron leaders and nursery teachers, what an important role you've got in trying to get that blueprint laid out down as early as possible. Wales offers a, a very resource-rich and immersive natural learning environment, but we don't all have access to amazing spaces, and we do have to understand there are challenges for some of you. Outdoor learning has to come in many forms, it uses many landscapes, and it can be challenging. And it's about finding a balance. We also have to accept not every child will love it. It's also about not, not about taking lots of material outside. You don't need lots of grab-and-go boxes full of bits of plastic. It's about taking advantage of what nature provides for us and using it in an imaginative way. So at NRW, to help explain this, we've developed our natural progression steps. And it shows how you can move step by step from being in and connecting with the natural world to establishing your lifelong positive behaviours that encourage all of us to look after our world now and in the future. The first two steps are our emotive connection with nature. Step one, nature needs to be experienced firsthand, through enjoyment, hopefully through a positive experience. And there again, that's where the role of all our foundation phase staff come in. If enjoyment can be found at that young age, a lifelong journey through nature can begin. Once we feel comfortable having spent sufficient time outdoors, step two kicks in and a relationship begins to form. And the better the experience, the more positive the results. 
We can all take positive steps to try and establish this connection. NRW manages woodlands and nature reserves across Wales. Within them, there's a range of facilities and habitats and uh, log circles and trails that you can visit for self-led visits. Many of them have site-specific resources to support them, and there's loads of games and activities on the website you can download to use. We also provide training in CPD for risk assessment, benefits, activities and ideas. And we also deliver the plant programme on behalf of Welsh Government, which we plant a tree for every child born and adopted in Wales. And every family receives a certificate and a letter showing them where that tree has been planted. And we like to try and encourage families to go and watch that tree grow as their child does. Steps three and four represent, or three to six, represent our cognitive connection. And as we gain more knowledge, we can go round these steps a few times. Step three is all about gaining the knowledge. Once we've developed that connection, we begin to understand all about natural processes. And that's built on in step four, as we begin to consider how our own actions have an impact on the environment. And you might have spotted that little bit of text in the middle there. There was a bit of research by Forestry Commission Scotland in partnership with Edinburgh University. And they found that a day out in the woods, not surprisingly, children were 2.7 times more active than they were on an average school day. What really knocked their socks off was the fact that they found that they were 2.4 times more active than a day with timetabled PE. So that's a day out in the woods covering all your curriculum subjects, all your learning, your play, your fun, and you're 2.4 times more active than a PE day. Really says something, that. Step five sees us taking a personal position. So we've got a deeper understanding of how the natural world has developed and we form our own opinions, so our opinions on climate change or our stance on recycling. NRW has introduced a number of resources at GCSE and A level and also Welsh back individual and group challenges that allow learners to examine real life environmental scenarios from flooding and fly tipping to water quality and forest planning. They can examine a real life problem, analyse the data and come up with the best opinion on the best course of action. Lastly, step six sees us influencing others. Hopefully, what the speakers tonight will do and what you as teachers and educators have the opportunity to do daily. You're the custodians of our future farmers, environmentalists, engineers, rangers, countryside wardens. You have an enormous role to play in helping our younger citizens enjoy and feel comfortable in the natural environment so they can understand and care for it in later life. However, no matter where we are on the steps, we all need a little help and support. So, there are a range of learning networks available out there to help you. The main one is Outdoor Learning Wales, and I believe we have some members of the Cardiff Network group here tonight. Can we have, oh, little waves, they are great. <laughs> so, Outdoor Learning Wales is a partnership between Natural Resources Wales and the Field Study Council, and it aims to raise awareness of first-hand outdoor learning opportunities. There are about 18 to 20 local groups around Wales, independent, locally managed and free to attend. They're not all active at any one time because they come and go depending on local need. And members include teachers, educators, landowners, environmental charities, local authority reps, basically anyone interested in nature and outdoor learning. Members share good practice, they take advantage of CPD and skill shares, receive a monthly newsletter, work with like-minded people on joint projects and programmes, some of which are eligible for funding. There's a website, loads of resources, an active Facebook and a Twitter account. Yes, we can embrace IT when we need to. And there's a small fund available every year, but many groups, groups don't access it. They find that coming together and sharing is enough to promote projects and programmes in their local area. Some of the projects recently we've seen are the Dovey Group working with Syrian refugees in Aberystwyth. The Cardiff Group, I believe, did CPD on everything to do with hibernation and hedgehogs. And the North East Wales groups are putting together a World War II project on the Talacra sand dunes, which were apparently used as target practice during the war, during the World War II, despite the fact that a lot of people from Liverpool had moved there to actually avoid the bombing. So that's going to be an interesting one. That project's going to explain how that landscape changed because of what happened at the time. We also have the Wales Council for Outdoor Learning, which acts as a voice for the sector and works to help um, uh, influence the curriculum. And that group, along with the Outdoor Education Advisors Panel, is about to launch the High Quality Outdoor Learning in Wales document. And I hope through Matthew and the comms team, we'll get a link to you, all of you um, once that document is available. The third one, Outdoor Learning Training Network, helps ensure quality and standards with accredited uh, units that are developed with, in partnership with Agorid Cymru. So we've got level one to four on forest school, coastal school, outdoor learning and play, and feeling comfortable outdoors. And one of the newest ones is, uh, is how to coordinate your outdoor curriculum. And for anyone leading on that subject in a setting, that's a really useful course to do. 
Uh, they're offered by independent providers around Wales and all you need to know from assessment in the outdoors, managing your sites, it resources, risk assessments and delivering activities. So, I'd like to encourage all of you to consider your own CPD. Look out for training courses. There are all sorts, a whole range being offered by lots of providers across Wales. Consider gaining an accredited qualification and consider joining your local outdoor um, Wales group and speak to these Cardiff members here. I'm sure they'll be able to tell you the positives. A couple of conferences coming up in North East Wales and South East, one by the, run by the local groups, um, showing how you can deliver the six areas of learning, uh, and they'll be advertised shortly. My colleague Karen, who's up there somewhere, there she is, will be around afterwards if you want to know anything more about what NRW or OLU can offer. And if we can't help, we usually signpost you to someone who can. And lastly, you'll be pleased, this is lastly, if you're still seeking inspiration or you want to get off the merry-go-round of life for five minutes, just get outside in the fresh air and let nature give you a boost. Squirrel suit's optional. Thank you. Well, Diolch and Vauriaun, C. Williams, thank you very much for your lively uh, talk there. And thank you, audience, for being so lively, too. It's great to hear. Um, and Cloir Nothon or Anna Sharadwir. The speakers of the evening, we have the campaigner and television presenter, Yola Williams. Very warm welcome. Thank you. That's one, thank you. Diolch and Vauriaun. Um, I'll start in English, but I will go over to Welsh later on because I'm going to tell you a little tale about um, uh, my childhood, really, and a huge influence on my life and um, why I do what I do now. But uh, to add to some of the stats and some of the facts and figures that we've already had, what, what really turned me on to how desperate I think the situation is, is when I read uh, four years ago now, I was down in London and someone said, have you seen this? And it was in the news. And it was the fact that the Oxford English Children's Dictionary had discarded words that it thought just weren't relevant to youngsters today. And amongst those words were buttercup, were bluebell, and conkers. I just, I just couldn't believe it. I was, I, I was quite stunned. And that, I think, was when I realized just how um, detached we'd become from wildlife from our countryside. I, I was uh, genuinely shocked by that. I knew it was bad, but I didn't realize it was that bad. Right, um, I'm not a politician. I'm uh, not a teacher. Um, I don't make policies. I can't influence them at all. So what I thought I would do is I would tell you about my childhood. Uh, idyllic in many ways. I was very, very lucky. But, um, I'm going to go over to Welsh now. Okay, there will be no technical terms. And I'll tell you what else I'm going to do. I'm going to move around. I'm going to move around because I like moving around when I talk. And it also confuses the two cameramen in here as well. So I was really very fortunate to grow up in a small village called Clanwithin in Mid Wales. And my mum and dad were very, very supportive of taking me out for a walk. But if I were to ask every one of you here, if there was one particular person who was a major influence on your life and what you do today, I would imagine that all of you would say perhaps it was your mum or your dad or an uncle or an auntie or a big brother or even a teacher. Very many of you, I'm sure, would say it was a teacher. A teacher, an influential teacher, is really worth his weight in gold. They're very, very important people. I know so many people who have followed careers in Welsh, in English, in history, in geography, because a teacher had influenced them so greatly. To me, that person was my grandfather. My grandfather, Tide, was a really very influential person, and I remember him. He was an old man. He lived to the age of 96, my Tide. He smoked a roly every day, and he drank a bottle of Watney's Pale Ale as well every day of the week, and he lived to the age of 96. So, he was an electrician by trade, but in his heart, he was a potcher. Tide was born in, in, in the 1880s, he was a very old man, and he had had to go out, he'd had to potch around, he'd had to shoot rabbits and fish to put food on the table. And he was so pleased that he had a little grandson, little three-year-old grandson, who was hanging on his every word, every word he said. 
Tide and I would go out for a walk and he'd say, go and have a look over there, go and have a look there in the bushes and the hedges there to see if you can find, you know, just for find if there's a little nest there. So I'd go over and have a little look and I'd say, I don't think there is a nest there, Tide. But he'd say, are you sure? Go and have another look. But lie on the floor this time. So down I would go onto the floor, lie down, look up to the sky. And of course in doing that, I could see that there was a, a nest there. I could see the nest against the skyline. And I'd say, Tide, there is a, ne a nest here. I, I, and he'd say, well, right, do you know what it is? I said, well, no, I don't. Go and have another look. So I'd have a look at the nest. And I'd say, well, it's quite a big nest, like a cup almost, full of, full of hay with a bit of mud in it. There's mud in the middle. And there are three eggs, light blue eggs with little black spots on them. He'd say, well, do you know what that is? I said, no, I don't come with me. So back we'd go and we'd stay and wait five minutes later there would be a song thrush that had come and sat on the egg and that was how I learned how to find nests. We'd go around the bushes and the hedges, we'd look for the little red robin, the blackbirds, everything was different, every egg was very very different. Then we'd go to the streams and the rivers, we'd learn about fish. Anybody here ever caught a fish by hand? It's fantastic. It's a fantastic thing to do. Just imagine now that there's a river here. You've got a river flowing from that side down here. And you, you have to go right down, very low in the front there. And the fish can see you. They can feel any movement. You get slowly up to the edge and put your hand over the edge. And very, very slowly, you start to tickle the fish. Start to feel the fish. The fish won't budge if you do it properly, very, very slowly, you move your hand up to its head. Once you get to the top, then you know that you've caught it. You put your thumb one side, your finger the other, and then grasp it, and out the fish would come. And so my tide, my grandfather taught me that. I knew how to ca catch fish. I sometimes do go and catch fish by hand. I put them back in. But he taught me what I could eat, what plants I could eat, the wood sorrel. Any wood sorrel? Anyone know what wood sorrel is? It's a common woodland plant. It looks like clover. Grows in woods. You can pick it up by the handful and you can eat the leaves. It's lovely. It's, it's like apple peel. It's really nice and sharp. So he'd take me to the field and show me, show me the pig nut. You could pick that up. You could put it, put a little hole down, pick it out. It's a pig nut. You can eat it. It's fantastic. And with fungi, he'd show me. Mushrooms. You can eat those. You can eat those. And so I learned about everything from Tide. I learned about everything by being outside all the time. Now, education, education, it's vitally important, but education comes in lots of different ways. And of course, one size doesn't fit all. You've seen from when I was a child, I learned by being outside. When it came to high school, that was when education and I became, became divorced, if you like. Because I remember on a Monday morning going 10 miles to school on the bus, sitting in the bus on a lovely sunny day in April, May, June. I'd look out to the window because the first lessons I had in Form 1, Year 7, they say, now Form 1 for me was double maths and physics. Exactly what I thought. Double maths and physics. Now, maths is fine in my head, but when it came to algebra, you know, I remember we had an exam and it said a bath of water holds 400 litres. Hot water tap, when it's turned halfway on, runs at 8 litres per second. The cold water turned halfway on runs at 16 litres per second. How long does it take to fill that bath three quarters full? And genuinely, now I was 11 years old, genuinely my answer was, as long as I get a hot bath, I don't really care. <laughs> and to this day, I genuinely, I've never had to use that. Never, never, never. So I was on the bus, and physics was no better. I was on the bus going into school, looking out, and I had to balance up. Right, okay, what do I do? Do I go for maths and physics, or do I go outside and do what I love doing? And I used to get off the bus, I used to bunk school. Now, I'm not saying the children should bunk school. Of course, I'd have social services after me now. But in those days, you know, that was what I did. And the truth of it all is that what I learnt outside is far more pertinent to what I do now than anything I would have learnt in school. So it goes back to this business of, you know, one size does not fit all. Our education system, by its very nature, 
cannot, cannot fit in every single individual child. It's a shame, you know, in an ideal world, of course it would, but it cannot. Now, I took my two boys, my two boys are older now, but I took them as I had been taken by tide. I took them out, I took them out to catch newts, to pick up newts, to turn them over, to look at the fiery belly underneath, taught them how to handle them properly, taught them how to put them back, taught them how to catch slowworms and lizards, not to pick them up by the tail because the tail comes off, but to pick them up properly, to have a look at them, to put them back where they were, make sure they were fine. I took them out. The sad thing is when I used to do this on the little country lanes around me in the woodlands, there was nobody else, nobody else out there doing this. When I was a little lad, I used to go off with Tide. We used to pump into everyone. And I remember pulling Tide's hands saying, come on, Tide, stop talking to them. I want to go and find more things. But there were people out there doing all of this. But as I say, when I took my two boys, we bumped into hardly anybody. And it is such a shame. The environment of a wildlife is so important. Of course, it's important to me because I'm passionate about the whole thing. And when I've argued, and one of the things I will carry on arguing for is to have a GCSE in natural history. I personally think that is so important. I've had things thrown back at me saying, well, teachers are overworked. And, you know, it's not as important as history and chemistry, is it really, in music? I would argue, yes, it is. It's far more important than that. It's only when we tell our youngsters what's out there, we educate them, we take them out, show them all of these things, that they will appreciate it that will then put a value on it, that they will then fight to look after it, that they will then get upset if we rip up hedgerows, if we build a new M4 through the Gwent levels that's going to destroy a fantastic part of Wales. That is when they will care. That is when they will want to look after their environment. So education is vitally important now more than ever. You look around you at what's going on. I was horrified the other day. I came in through Radir part of Cardiff. Cardiff in the next eight years is going to have 41,500 new houses built in and around it. Cardiff can't handle the number of cars it's got now. That's going to add 80,000 more cars to it. And I went and watched diggers digging up an old hedgerow. And I asked the farmer who lived next door, he said, that hedgerow, he said, my Granddad was a kid when that hedgerow was put in the ground. And it was a fantastic hedgerow full of berries. It's gone. And once it's gone, it ain't going to come back. It is incredibly, incredibly sad. Now, if you want to know how important wildlife is, I was invited about five years ago now to go and open a reserve in a small village in Mid Wales. And I happened to be going past that day, and I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pop by. I'll, I'll pop by. And um, it, it really, in the big scheme of things, it, it you know, wasn't a very good reserve. It, it was owned by Natural Resources Wales. It was a, a forestry, and it had been felled, and the ground was too wet and too hard to replant. So they said, I'll tell you what, let's give it to the local community. They can make a little nature reserve out of it. Now, in the big scheme of things, you know, it wasn't a Skomer Island or a Comidwal. It was quite a rubbishy little reserve, but it was the best reserve in the world because it was their reserve. It was a community reserve. And the local builders, the local farmers had come out. They dug a, a path all the way through. They dug some ponds there. They planted some trees. Some of the willow and the birch had grown there anyway. And they asked me, would you come down and open it? So I went down and blow me, I arrived expecting two men and a whippet. The whole village was there. Or the Pentre Kava Wadidorathan. The whole village was there. And the school had closed for the afternoon so that all the youngsters could come out and see this opening. So I got there, said some words, God knows what I said, cut the ribbon. And then I said, come on, let's go and have a walk. So we walked in, and within five minutes, I'd found uh, an elephant hawk moth caterpillar. Now, those of you who've never seen it, it's about the size of my middle finger. And the adult moth is beautiful. It's kind of lime green and pink. But the caterpillar is grey-brown with two big eyes, one end. And if you tap it on the back, it rears up like an elephant's trunk. Now, by the time 40 kids had tapped it on the back, <laughs> it was too tired to rear up 
on its back, but they were all mesmerized by this. They came and had a look at it. Oh, look at that. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So we then put it back on some rose bay willow herb, made sure it went back, and I explained why, because that's what it eats. That's what it was. So we put it back exactly there. We moved on. There were some dragonflies and damselflies. I went out and had a look in this little willow tree and had a look in it, and I thought, I'll have a look in here. Didn't find anything. Walking away, when a little voice, little girl, eight years old, shock of blonde hair, Megan, said, sir, sir, and I turned around and said, yes, sir, look what I've got. And I went over and had a look, and blow me, she'd found an eyed hawk moth caterpillar. It dwarfed what I found. It's a big, huge thing. It's kind of lime green with lovely yellow lines. It's a stunning thing. So I said, Megan, that's, that's fantastic. Bring it over here. Hold it carefully. Bring it over here. And she brought it over. Whole school came round and had a look at it. And I said, now, what's important is that Megan holds it. Megan found this, so Megan holds it. So she held it out and showed everybody. And I said, okay, Megan, now you are allowed to go back and put it exactly where it was. Put it back on there. There you go. Good girl. Brilliant. There we are. So we then walked on. We saw a few other things. Chiff, chaff, willow, wobble, whatever it was. And at the end, you know, I said, Dear thanks for coming, everyone. Blah, blah, blah. Goodbye. So the school all, they were going to walk back up. One teacher peeled off and came back around. And she said, that was fantastic, she said. Not, not me, but she said, that was fantastic, she said. And I said, why? She said, because Megan is one of those children who doesn't quite fit in in school. We have sports day. We, we play soccer, we play rugby, the girls will play soccer, they'll play netball and hockey. We have some very good athletes in school. Megan isn't one of those. We have the Eisteddfod, of course, a big thing in Wales. We have some singers here, beautiful, some guitar players. Some, some of the lads can recite particularly well. The girls will sing Cerdant. Megan isn't one of those. Megan has never really quite fit in. She's not part of the cool crowd until today. Because when they walk back, the coolest girls in school wanted to walk back with her. Do you remember in school, you'd walk two by two back, you'd hold hands and walk. The coolest girls in school wanted to walk back with her. So just finding that one caterpillar had made Megan fit in. And who knows, in 20 years' time, Megan, who knows what she'll do, but I guarantee you, she will always, always, always remember finding that caterpillar that one day. That one day. And that's why you and the roles that you play are so very important. We have to get it right with the youngsters. We have to get it right with the next uh, generation. We have the tools. We have the Future um, Generations Act now. On paper, it looks fabulous. In practice, at the moment, it's not delivering. It should do. It needs funding. And it saddens me because when I was in school, every single school had a nature table. Some of you will remember that. We had a wasp nest cut in half and turned on its back so that you could see inside a wasp nest. We had one or two old nests on there. We had leaves, oak leaves and ash leaves and sycamore leaves, all of these things on there. And more than anything else, we had frog spawn. We had an aquarium with frog spawn. And I tell you one thing, there were kids in there with no interest in wildlife. We were, if we were away for a week over Easter, we'd come back on the Monday morning, everyone would gather around and you'd watch these little black dots become little black sausages, hatch out, and then grow little back legs, and then little front legs, and then the tail would disappear. And I learnt the longest word I've ever learnt, metamorphosis. I haven't learnt anything longer than that even since then. And then we'd watch them become little frogs. And then the teacher would say, and it was a momentous day every year, say, right, time for all of us to take these back to the pond. And the whole school would walk back to the pond with his tank and release them back into the pond. It was an annual event. Conkers, I walked through Butte Park the other day, and it saddened me to see conkers lying on the floor. There's nothing quite like a fresh conquer, is there? When it opens for the first time, the colour, it is beautiful. It is nature at its very best. When I was little, a conquer would sit on the floor for five seconds maximum. It would. It would be picked up straight away. 
game of conkers in school? No, it honestly saddens me when I walk around. I see conkers everywhere. And I just think, you know, what's happened to us? Nobody plays conkers. I know health and safety is one thing. Don't start me on that. Otherwise, you'll be here for four hours listening to my rant. <laughs> but we've forgotten about all of these things. When I am older, when I am in my wheelchair, I'll be telling my two boys, I'll be boring them to death about me as a child, listening to Skylax. Walking to the shop, mum asking, would you go, dossing all we are, go and get some eggs. And listening to grasshoppers on the bank all the way down and all the way back up again. I don't hear that anymore. They're gone. I saw a picture of myself as an eight-year-old with my two, two brothers the other day. And something I hadn't noticed before, there were wires up above us. So it must have been August, September. And there were about 50, 50 house martins on there. When was the last time you saw that many house martins? You know, I haven't seen that many for decades. And it's only when they've gone that we'll miss them. You think of all the poetry in English and Welsh that's written about the song of the skylark, about the curlew, about the lapwing, about all of these things. So it's far more than just wildlife. It's part of us. It's part of our heritage. It's an important part. It's part of our culture. It's in us. So it's vitally, vitally important that we look after it, that we don't lose it. In order to do that, we need education, education, education. So please, some of you I know, I was able to speak to some of you earlier, do a fantastic job. And it's not right that often it depends on the will and the enthusiasm and the knowledge of one individual, one or two in a school. It should be an integral part of the national um, curriculum. It should be, we should have a GCSE in natural history so we can reconnect youngsters with wildlife. We've all seen, when you do it, you take them pond dipping. They love it. Children are supposed to get muddy. Children are supposed to get wet feet. Children are supposed to walk through cow poo. That's what children are supposed to do. And they're not having that opportunity. And that's because we are robbing them of that. So please, go home. Please be inspired by wildlife. Wales has got some of the best wildlife in the world. It really has. Be inspired by it and be inspiring. Thank you very much. Williams, thank you very much. Right then, well, um, a few challenges for you there, Kirsty Williams, but I'll, I'll ask the audience first. We'll start here, then Amida Hrevenin. Um, introduce yourself, what's your name and, and what's the question? My name's Ethan Hall, I'm a teacher at Fitzalan. Um, I notice both in this room and in many uh, nature events that I've been to, there's a demo, certain demographic. I think if looking around, there are very few visible ethnic minorities here. And I found uh, teaching at Fitzalan, which is a very, very diverse school, that the very few students I do find that are interested in nature are from the same demographic we are. What do you think we need to do to get visible ethnic minorities more involved in nature and more involved in the same things that we're passionate about? Okay, thank you very much. An interesting question to kick us off there. Um, well, Sue, so we might start at this end and work our way over to, uh, to Kirsty Williams here. Sue, so, do you want to start? That's quite a difficult one, really. I mean, all the uh, all this support mechanism, mechanisms that we can offer in Natural Resources Wales don't make any discrimination. They're available to to everybody. Um, have, you, have you noticed this in the uh, in the demographic that engages with your services? Yeah, you're probably right. So that could be said for a lot of things, I suppose, in in Wales. I mean, it was interesting that that uh, project recently run by the Dubby Group. That was working with a group of Syrian refugees who've um, settled in Aberystwyth. They hadn't been out of the actual sort of estate that they'd settled on. They were keeping themselves to themselves. And part of the success of that project was actually getting them into the woodlands of Wales. Um, but they found they learned from each other. They, they did a lot around the campfire, cooking. They were bringing, exchanging recipes, exchanging songs and cultural takes. That's, a, that's a, a unique project. It was truly innovative. We see lots of pro the same project coming over and over again. So we commented ourselves that that was very innovative. Um, the opportunities are there. 
uh, we have to be fair in the way we allow them to happen in Wales. We have to be fair to everybody. Thank you. Um, your law, um, you know, uh, this question came, to, came from Fitzalan in a school here in Cardiff. You know, you were brought up in rural Wales. These opportunities were there. How do you take those opportunities to city schools like Fitzalan and places like that? Um, can, can I just uh, make one point, first of all? My best mate um, is, is a Kenyan... Pakistani lad, Shaquille, I've known Shaq for 40 years now, he, he, he and I are big mates, and, and oddly enough, he and I were talking about this about two, three years ago, and, and I was lamenting the fact, you know, when, when I give talks, never anyone from uh, 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 Asian background, um, uh, black, whatever, never, it's, it's nearly always all white. And I said, why? And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing, he said, my dad, he said, came from a very poor village just outside Lahore. And he said that your success in life was measured by leaving that village, leaving a rural area, and going live in a big town or a big city where you made your money. And he said, we still, to a large extent, have that mentality now. He said, because if you'd ask me how I would measure the success of my kids, and he's got three, he said that all three, one works in Manchester, one is a lawyer in London, and the, the other girl, she works in Birmingham, all three live in a big, big city, and he thinks that they've done well because they earn an awful lot of money. Now, I'm not knocking it, but he said it's just a different mentality. If I went back to Lahore, he said, and I went and lived back in that village, they'd think I was a failure. So it, I, I think we've got to tackle lots of things, but one of them is a completely different mentality as well. You know, the... the um, it, it, I mean, I was asking him, what do we do? And he said, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. And another thing that often happens, when I go and give talks, probably 90% of the people in there are above the age of 65. You know, getting youngsters to come along as well, it's a really difficult thing. But the one heartening thing is I, I walk a lot. I walk an awful lot. And I've seen more um, Asian and black people in Snowdonia and the Beacons in the last five years than I've ever seen before. And numbers, I think, are going up and up and up and up. And I'm hoping that that shows that we're finally getting the message across. You know, they, the other thing that they need, of course, is they need role models. And on TV, you look at all the TV natures, nearly all of them are white, middle class, English, Welsh, whatever it is. But we finally do have a few. The Urban Birder, David Lindo, he's on a lot of things, The One Show, what have you now. So uh, it, we're getting there. We're getting there too slowly by a long mile. What else we do? Um, I think we turn to Kirsty and ask her for an answer. <laughs> Thank you for the... Uh, there you are, um, so Kirsty, first off, maybe, um, how do we ensure that it's not just the preserve of white middle class, I suppose, you're, is what you're alluding to. How do we make natural education, you know, the out great outdoors, something that we can all value and engage with? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Fitzalan is a uh, hugely diverse school and a very successful school. And part of its success is the diversity of the children that attend that school. And uh, that's what makes it so successful, I think. Uh, Yolo makes a really good point about role models. I'm a great believer in the principle of children can't be what they can't see. Uh, and actually, if we're talking about diversity uh, within uh, natural history, I think we have a diversity issue in our teaching workforce. Uh, so uh, before we, we try and tackle uh, Yolo's problem, I'd like to tackle the diversity issue within our teaching, uh, within our teaching workforce. I think it's really challenging for children uh, who do not see at the front of their classroom the community that they're from or the, the society uh, reflected in the people who teach them. So I think that's a real challenge uh, for, for all of us. And I think what would be interesting for me is to ask the children why they're not interested. Uh, because I think pupil voice uh, is, is really, really important and an understanding of perhaps uh, why that isn't an area that particularly people are interested in and engaged, engaged in and what are the barriers because often I think we do um, we uh, can put barriers up. You're right, it's a real challenge in some of our uh, 
uh, inner city schools providing the, these, some of these opportunities because to be able to access some of these opportunities takes resources and when school budgets are, are, are tight, finding uh, the financial resource to take children out and about can be difficult and also especially in the secondary setting actually the focus is very much on um, educational uh, uh, outcomes so therefore sometimes the pressure in within the school is we haven't got time to do that because if we spend time uh, doing that that's going to impact on a, our ability to do uh, other things and I think the point was well made that actually you don't it doesn't have to be an either or actually you can reinforce lots of aspects of the uh, of the curriculum but you know I've seen some amazing practice uh, in some of our, you know, in our schools where they are, you know, really struggling either for outdoor space or for access to those opportunities. So Sandfields Primary, a very deprived part of uh, Port Albert, um, you know, not a lot of resource and not easy access, big um, social housing estate. Uh, you know, what they've been able to do with um, some planks of wood and some logs out in, in, in the yard to introduce their very youngest pupils has been uh, really interesting. Uh, and I was explaining earlier, you know, visiting a primary school recently here in the heart of the city uh, with the Farms on Tour programme. So these are local farming community that work together to bring farms uh, out uh, into in the city schools. Uh, they had a couple of cows on the yard, uh, sheep on the yard, uh, and you know, children really, really, you know, really interacting uh, and getting a lot out of it. But I'd want to understand from the, from the children themselves why they feel that's not for them. A lot of them say it's just, it's not something their family have ever talked about. Uh, so that kind of comes back to what uh, Yola was saying. Yeah, it's uh, from the culture. And additionally, it's because they would rather play Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Ethan. Interesting question to kick us off. Um, there's a hand up in the back. I'm going to allow and Hello, uh, my name's Pavla Bolton. I'm from the University of South Wales. Um, I, just, I just wonder if, um, particularly Kirsty, I can, I can address you with a question, if that's okay. Um, we've, based, we've, we've heard a lot tonight from, from Sue uh, uh, and from Yolo about you know, present, presentation of data and facts about the importance of children being reconnected with nature, uh, the effects it has on their well-being, the effects it will have on the sustainability of our planet, really. And if we are taking words out of the dictionary so they don't know what a conquer is, well, I don't know where we're going with that, to be honest. My question is, will the new curriculum have a, have a specific requirement for children to be educated outside as part of the holistic curriculum? Because I think that's got to be one of the ways we capture children's um, awe and wonder back into their learning. And I think it's a really important, important issue. Thank you very much for the question, a very timely one as well. So, Kirsty Williams, will the new curriculum have an explicit reference to outdoor learning, is what we're asking. Will we see that explicitly referred to? Uh, well, the, the legislation that will underpin uh, the curriculum is currently being developed at the moment, and it's too early. I, I can't give you a commitment here and now that, that will have that explicit uh, wording on the face uh, on the face of the bill. I think what I'm more interested in, again, in understanding, is why schools need that explicit uh, on the face of a bill statutory underpinning. There is nothing to stop a school now engaging in this agenda, and I'm concerned that the only way we can do it if we make it a statutory underpinning, because it's actually got to be the new curriculum, and indeed the current curriculum. Uh, and I want to reassure Yolo. He, he talks about the things that he experienced and witnessed as a child. I can t I can tell you, I go to schools every week, and lots and lots of this stuff is still going on in our schools. The idea that nothing like this happens in our schools is not the reality of most schools that I that I go to so um, what we're trying to avoid in drawing up the new curriculum and especially the legislation is having a long list the whole principle behind Donaldson's report is about going back to the professional the professional expertise of the teachers to be able to dictate to be able to create a curriculum that is right for their children, right for their school, right for the culture uh, and the environment in which that education is being delivered. And if we start, uh, if we if we give if we start listing things again, well, all of this will be for nothing. Well, we might as well stick with what we've got at the moment. But I, you know, what I what I struggle with is the idea that you need me 
in a piece of legislation to tell schools this is what they've got to do? But just um, picking up on this, maybe a point uh, people would make is, at the moment, we know that people are measured on A-level results, GCSE results, yeah. PISA results, pressures on yourselves for that. Yeah. So people know that they have to achieve those standards. If you don't put it in legislation, you know, where do people turn to? Oh, yeah, well, we've done well in this, but they can't refer to anything solid. They can't, so, you know, there's nothing to measure their success against if you don't put that in legislation, surely? No, 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 no. You don't put it in legislation. You put it in the accountability regimes that we put in place for schools. Because, actually, that is what motivates people, is the issues around accountability, and whether that is Welsh Government accountability measures, Eston accountability measures, or regional consortia accountability measures. So you're absolutely right. Schools will do... Uh, what they think they're going to be measured on. Really good schools spend a little, little less time worrying about that, but, you know, so schools will do what they think they're going to be held accountable for, and that's why we're changing our accountability regime, because at the moment it is all focused on levels, GCSEs, and A-level performance. We're changing that to say, actually, uh, we need our education system, yes, to be making sure children leave with the qualifications they need, because they need them. But actually, education is about much more than that in Wales. It is about the well-being of our children. It is about the four purposes of the curriculum, the kind of people we want to leave our education system, the skills, the understanding, and the characteristics that those young people ha will have as a result of being in our education system. So I don't think you need to legislate for it, but what you do need to do is ensure that you don't have unintended consequences by the way we hold schools to account. And I think that's where we've gone wrong in the past, and that's why we're changing it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions from the floor? Please uh, raise your hands. There's one right up here again. Oh, we'll come back to you after. Are you okay? <laughs> Thanks. Hello, I'm Angela Peterkin and I'm a learning support assistant. Um, I'm lucky enough to work as a forest school leader and um, I'm really pleased to do that. Um, but just, <coughs> sorry, one of the um, sort of it's following on from the previous question really, um, is that in our school, when somebody's left, um, they're not being replaced, and that comes down to money, and so it means that I can't do what I want to do, and that, um, that I have the skills to do, and um, the school wants me to do it in theory, but if they haven't got the manpower in the classroom, they can't let me get out of the classroom. And I just wondered, although we have this lovely new curriculum, if the funding's not there for somebody like Nick, me to get outside, um, you know, it's disappointing then if I'm stuck indoors. Um, okay, so I think I will ask you to respond to this because it is an issue of budgeting. It's an issue of you know, how do people, you set out a vision there, but how do people realise that where, when they're under those pressures, when schools are under those pressures? Yeah, yeah well... The first thing I would say is I wouldn't want to underplay the significant uh, financial pressures that are, there are in the system. Uh, things are, are, are difficult, uh, and we are, within the education department, trying our best to uh, get as much money to the front line as we possibly can from the department and having discussions with our colleagues in local government, which is where most schools get their funding from, to do, uh, to do the same. Uh, all I would say, uh, again, is uh, I wish that I could tell you that austerity is going to end tomorrow and things will be, be will be better. Uh, you know, we'll see uh, whether that happens. But again, it is about, you know, either using that, that e either, either using the difficult circumstances that we, so schools budget certainly face, just not to do things or finding creative ways around uh, creative ways around those problems because I think you know our children deserve that we're never going to be in a situation where we have enough money I think that I've, that would please uh, everybody so we've got to be creative with the resources that we have got to try and find uh, these opportunities now I know that's not easy but that's what we've got to try and do uh, is to work within the constraints of what we've got at the moment to try and you know be as uh, as innovative uh, in these challenging times as we can, because we otherwise otherwise the children lose out. Um, Sue, can I bring you in on this? You know, what would you engage with people who are trying to provide this sort of education? How? What would your advice to be to somebody in that situation? How can they manage those pressures? Yeah, I, I think I do agree. There are schools that do amazing things. Our school, Sandshore, up in North Wales, with its school farm and its school zoo. You know, there are standout schools doing amazing things, but. 
those schools don't see outdoor learning as a bolt-on. So they don't see Forest School as something you do only on a Wednesday morning, so they, therefore you need to be timetabled to be released. They have it woven into the school. So I think probably if we can't have legislation in, within the curriculum that states outdoor learning is, is statutory, we have to build it into teacher training so that all our teachers coming out can understand how our outdoor learning just sits underneath everything, that you can assess in the outdoors. I, th I think uh, we were Forestry Commission at the time when the foundation phase was introduced and we worked with John Hawkins at the time and we went out and we trained all the foundation phase um, teachers um, through a, a, a theatre in the, in the woods type project. And I think we were all guilty then of sitting back and go, oh, and Forest School was just being launched and it was all interweaving brilliantly. And I think we were all a bit guilty of thinking, oh, there we go, done that now, so outdoor learning sorted. But of course, as the curriculum then evolved and then more assessment came in on top, teachers started to feel, oh, I've got to do my assessment, I've got to have it down on paper, I must go back in the classroom to assess. But you can assess, as you know, as a forest school leader, you can assess just as much maths and literacy outside as you can in the classroom. So if we could get that wider understanding of how everything all links together, and it's not a standalone thing that has to be timetabled just as a ring-fenced item, then I think we could help move things forward. And then it wouldn't be seen as just a budget issue. It would be interwoven and much, and much easier to release staff into the, back into the outdoors. Okay, thank you. I know there's so much more to say, but I really want to get uh, one more question in before we have to wind things up. Um, so I will take a question from myself. If you can introduce yourself and tell us what your question is. I'm a teaching assistant um, in a city school, Adams Down. Um, I'm also from Kenya. <laughs> So that's a bit different. And I'm also a scout leader um, in, in a village down in Sally. And um, just to mention what Sue Williams said, that um, a research carried out in Scotland said that children who went out um, were outside learning were 2.4 more active than a PE day. And... Um, Considering as this is so important and it's really dire at the moment, have the schools or would the schools consider to alternate instead of having actually a PE day and having an outdoor learning event instead of PE and alternating or doing actually just outdoor learning instead of PE? Is that something that could be you know, beneficial to the children? So. I might ask um, Yolo about this because uh, he had an interesting take on uh, school, day, uh, school days. Yolo, um, if you were really going to introduce your vision of a natural education, what would you substitute? You know, what would you put it in place of? Because surely you, you acknowledge that you know, what children are currently learning, the curriculum is important, is it? Do you, do you appreciate that you know, maths, science, Welsh, English are very important? Well, yeah. If... <laughs> If you drop physics out of that, I would probably agree with you, yes. Um, no, of course they are, but they're no more important. And actually, I would say that they're less important than getting people, getting youngsters out into the countryside. And I think that, um, you know, somehow in Wales, we found enough money to send bards, to send singers around schools, but not to send people around schools to educate them about the wildlife and the open air. We've talked about mental health issues. We've talked about overweight issues, you, you know, it would, it would help to tackle those two, it, it help immensely. Not that I'm saying the music isn't important, but we found money to send bads to schools. We found money to send musicians to schools. Why not get money, you know, use some of that money to get youngsters outside as well? Okay, Kirsty Williams, I was going to have to ask you this question at some point. So how about it, a natural history GCSE? <laughs> well, I think... Interestingly, how we're going to assess the new curriculum, especially for high stakes qualifications at the end of compulsory schooling, is something that's being developed at the moment. That's one of the reasons I've taken the decision to slow the rollout of the curriculum in the secondary sector. Because if you think about what the new curriculum is actually going to mean, what GCSEs are going to look like at the end of this are going to have to change. And that work is currently being done. Uh, qualifications Wales are very much involved in the development of the content of the curriculum. So how we assess that curriculum is is going to have to change. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that I don't have the power to create a, a, a GCSE. You can endorse it if uh, you can endorse well, I can't, it. No, no, I can't endorse it. I can't even endorse it either. But what I think I'd like to go back to the point about 
uh, realising the opportunities of the new curriculum. Uh, and I think professional learning and professional development is going to be absolutely key. There will be some teachers who are ready to embrace this. There will be lots of teachers who have only ever done their teaching under the national curriculum uh, who might find some of this stuff really, really some of this stuff really, really challenging. So that's why we're going to have to invest heavily in professional learning if we're to realise the opportunities of the new curriculum. Because we can have fantastic content, but if our staff aren't ready to embrace it and deliver it, then we're going to struggle. So that's why we've been through an EWC, a very important part of accrediting our, our future initial teacher education programmes. So those are teachers that are going to come through into our schools. But we have a whole body of professionals who are already in our our schools and we need to make sure as Welsh Government that we're in a position to support their professional uh, development and learning ready for the new curriculum and I'm hoping to make some announcements on that before, uh, before Christmas because uh, in the end an education system cannot exceed the quality of the people who stand in front of our children day in and day out and we can have a fabulous curriculum we're investing heavily in school buildings but unless we invest equally in our staff then the opportunities will not, uh, will not be realised. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, I, the first hand I saw go up. I'm sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, Mark Hawes from Newport. I just want to find, uh, I, I want to say thank you to uh, both speakers. Brilliant. And I just hung on every word that Yola was talking about. Brilliant. Um, but what I want to ask is, is in a situation like um, what we're talking about tonight, how is it measurable and how when Essendon come to visit, how are we going to sort of prove to them that we have than what has been asked of us in relation to outdoor learning, because they will beat you, and we know that as teachers, it's, it's the scariest time that comes upon us, and it's not something we look forward to. Yeah, this, uh, yeah Christy, I, if you want to take No, I, I, absolutely, uh, I absolutely understand where you're coming from, so we need to align all our accountability and assurance measures to make it in line with the curriculum. And I understand, so uh, you'll know that Estin have got a new framework which they started using last year. They're currently, out to they're currently out doing some work at the moment about how you measure well-being. What's really important as we develop the content of the curriculum is that we actually develop assessment alongside it so we know how to measure children's progress. That's easier to do in some areas uh, than others. But we also need then Estin to be asking the same questions as your challenge advisor is asking you so that, we, so that teachers know exactly you know what is expected of them and the also the other difference to we, the also the other thing we need to do is stop using assessment for accountability, assessment is for learning. Assessment is about where do we go next in that child's education. Assessment is not about beating a teacher or an individual school over the head. There's a different way in which we can measure school performance, and it should never be about the individual assessment of a child. And the fact that those things have got mixed up in recent years has not helped us. Okay, to close, I'll ask each of you in turn. Uh, so I'll come to you first. If you can keep it brief, because I'm going to wind up with this. Um, in your vision of you know, a realised um, natural education, what would your vision of a school lesson look like? It wouldn't be a school lesson. It would be something that's integrated throughout the school day and the school week. So it, it's not just a lesson. Outdoor learning, environmental education, it can underpin everything. So I think that's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see children with equal access to the indoors and outdoors, but also taking their history outside, their geography, their maths, their literacy outside, but also knowing what a conquer is, being able to identify an oak tree, everything just interwoven. To, uh, it's going to be more project-based, isn't it, the new curriculum, and it, uh, it just fits so well with that. Yolo? Uh, I think, quite simply, a lesson outside. A lesson outside with a teacher who really knows his or her subject, you know, just enthusing, teaching the kids and just getting them hands-on education out in the open air. Kirsty, anything to add to that? I, I just really think that we will, if we still, can, if we continue to think about separate subjects, then the new curriculum uh, won't work. It is about having an underpinning uh, across all areas of learning. So you, you outside, you can do uh, your literacy, you can do your numeracy, you can do your science, you can do your health and well-being. All of those things can happen in a lesson uh, outside. I was recently at a school, they've got 60 chickens. Like, and, uh, and they use those chickens as a, 
as a learning resource. Those children use those, they take responsibility for those. They actually raise quite a lot of money for the school because they flog the eggs to the estate in which the, um, in which the, the school is situated. Every aspect of what we would expect a child to be gaining from their primary education can all happen outside with those chickens. So that's, so that's what's the important thing, is understanding quite rightly. This is not an add-on. This is not something that can, needs necessarily to be timetabled. This can underpin an ethos in an individual setting. And the thing about our new curriculum is that individual schools will be able to listen to their children. Children will be le learning will be children-led, and it will, uh, the curriculum will sit comfortably in the environment that that school is being delivered in. It will not be a national checklist where somebody will have to sit there and say, I've done that, 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 that. Because that's not what the new curriculum is going to be about. Okay, Diolch Mawr Iawn. Thank you very much. Thank you to the three speakers this evening. Thank you, thank you, the audience. Thank, thank you very much for being a very engaging audience as well, and thank you for your willingness to contribute. It's always wonderful when we've got such great audience engagement. I'm now just going to quickly hand over to Angela Jardine, Chair of Education Workforce Council, and Louise Casella, Director of the Open University. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Open University in Wales, I'd just like to thank our, our fabulous speakers tonight, and Devon thought-provoking conversations, um, inspiration to us all. Um, you might wonder why is the OU here sponsoring? Why, why, we, why us? Well, um, Kirsty sort of talked about learning for life. That's what we do. That's what we're about, it's about being here, giving people a second chance if they need it and getting out for those, for those who need a change in direction, perhaps. Um, Sue talked about um, reconnecting in life with things that you might have connected it with as a child and again we, we can help with that we can be there for those things and uh, I think Yolo's tales of school not being for him are tales we hear day in day out from our students who come back to us later to learn more so lots there for the Open University to connect with and we're delighted to sponsor this evening's talk and I, one of the things I'm not going to apologize for is the amount of screen time we create um, we create it for our learners and we create it in co-production with the BBC about learning about the future. And we are the university that co-produced uh, Blue Planet and perhaps doing some of the work that's the research behind the work that's now creating that social movement behind dealing with our overuse of plastics as a, as a generation perhaps. But, but how, how much better not to have to do that with future generations? How much better to build that in to the curriculum from the outset. So there's that connection in the early years with the world that we live in. So congratulations to the Education Workforce Council on tonight's event. We are delighted to have been sponsors of it and to be part of it. And uh, congratulations, more importantly, perhaps, to uh, those who are behind this movement for a natural education. And uh, we look forward to that, that coming into force. So thank you very much all. Diolch yn fawr hefyd gan ni yn cyngor y gweithiadysg. Um, as a, an early years primary teacher myself, uh, I used to quite shock people. We'd have parents coming in to see where their children were going to be learning, and I'd welcome them into the best classroom in the world, and they'd think, well, that was a bit presumptuous of me, wasn't it? But we were talking about them being... Uh, educated outside for the, the vast majority of the week. And they saw their children develop and become uh, involved in their learning, going home, talking with enthusiasm about what they've been doing in school and what they've been learning. So I'd say that as our curriculum grows up with these new children that are having these experiences, don't be surprised if it's not them themselves who are lobbying YOLO for a GCSE in natural education or some formal way of recognizing that. Um, I'd also say that I thoroughly uh, uh, recommend that um, institutes of initial teacher education invite YOLO along to speak to their new students and the newly qualified teachers because I think after that inspirational chat there, nobody could, but could fail to be involved in the uh, benefits of an outdoor education. I'd like to thank every single one of you for your contributions tonight. Very, very interesting, very, very thought-provoking. And I hope that that's inspired us all to take that message out when we go back to our various settings. Um, I'd like to thank our partners at the OU for their sponsorship, because without their um, 
generosity and their enthusiasm, evenings like this wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much there. And I would also like to thank the staff who have been very, very, very active in making sure this evening is a success. And we value very much the work that they've done on our behalf. And last of all, big thanks to you for turning out on a Monday evening in the late October when we're just crawling to the end of term, those of you that are in the maintained settings. Hopefully you found it very, very useful and inspiring. Hope you've enjoyed the evening. And we're just going to have a little presentation. So thank you very much. <laughs>